We'll, I am. I we'll am get. ready Thank whenever you. you tell me to be ready. Okay. Well, first of all, let's welcome everybody here to the First Coast Free Thought Society monthly Zoom room. Uh, we are an organization of individuals who prefer science and reason over religious dogma and fanaticism. We've enjoyed the non-religious community of Northeast Florida since 1998. Uh, we are now in our 24th year. That impresses me. <laughs> Today, we commem commemorate and celebrate President's Day. Originally established in 1885, recognition of President George Washington, the holiday became known as President's Day after it was moved as part of the 1971's Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which enacted to create more three-day weekends, President's Day. I suppose we honor some presidents more than some others. Free fro, 2022, free Flow 2022 is happening the weekend of March 4, 5, and 6 in Orlando at the Orlando Marriott Lakeside Hotel, which is at the Orlando airport. Um, a large gathering of fellow free thinkers will enjoy informative presentations, networking opportunities, exhibitors, and lots of entertainment. You can learn more by visiting our meetup group and check out all the information there, or you can learn more at their free flow website, which is free flow, F R E E F L O dot org, no W. We are online too Facebook, Twitter, Meetup, and Instagram. We have Secular Sunday in the Park, book and movie discussion groups, the Free Thinker newsletter for which we invite your submissions. Right, Fred? We invite your submissions. We're looking for people to submit. We love submissive people. Is that what we're saying? We're looking for your submissions. Our website is firstcoastfreethoughtsociety.org or fcfs.org. Now, is anyone here new to what we're doing? Anybody here, this is their first time through? Anybody? If, you, if so, are you willing to say hello? If not, welcome back. Okay. Uh, anybody hear us on NPR? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I'm not new to free thought. I'm a secular humanist, but I am new to your group. And thank you for welcoming me. And hello. Oh, you're not interrupting. I actually invited you. Well, who's speaking, though? I don't know. Who, uh, oh, oh um, I'm Candace. I don't use video. Okay. Uh, you should have a little uh, fake person up there with my name on it. Great. Oh, okay. Well, Candace, how did you hear about us, if you don't mind? Um, I don't know. I, I searched Meetup. I'm new to the area and um, was looking for secular groups, uh, Meetups, but uh, one category, of course, was secular groups. And um, so that's probably how I found you. Thank you, Candace. Well, welcome, Candace. We appreciate you. you being here. Um, uh, we're, we're all volunteers here, Candace, and yet we do incur expenses, largely promotion. We have promoted online, on the radio, and in print, and if you know a viable place for us to promote, please share. Maybe college newspapers? Maybe college newspapers. That might be a good idea. We also have some associated costs for websites and fees for regulatory compliance as a 501c3. So if you can see your way clear to offer a donation of 10, 20, $50, or $100 or more, you'll be part of the reason we're able to continue our public outreach. And now we offer a beautiful logo t-shirt with every donation of $100 or more. Just tell us your color preference, size, mailing address, and we'll send you one. And you can see our website for the details on that. We're tremendously grateful for all those who've become members and have made donations. We need you. And now in the beginning of the year is a great time to start making the donations. Tonight, 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 tonight we are pleased to welcome back David Schwambert, affectionately known as the Schwami. Uh, David really needs no introduction. We can only hope he has a conclusion. Uh, well, that's, <laughs> excuse me, David, that's an old Friars Club remark. That's I know you're. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, 
uh, personally, I'm fascinated by what David will offer tonight, a presentation he calls The Curse of the Disciple, New Thoughts about Free Thoughts, rife with examples from real life. And personally, I love curses. A discussion will follow. Should you prefer, you may message your question via the Zoom chat feature, and please mute your mic until it's time to speak. Be reminded that we are recording for posterity. Everyone who wants to speak will be given ample opportunity to do so. So speak up when the time is right. So let's enjoy the time, the expertise and insights graciously offered to us by David Schwamberg. David, we're all yours. Okay, well, uh, this is uh, a departure, as uh, Ken had mentioned before. Uh, generally, I am uh, going to be talking about something political, and uh, I would be talking about uh, Russia and Ukraine, or I would be talking about the Middle East, or I'd be talking about China. Uh, but for a long time, I wanted to try something uh, different. So I finally got up the gumption to do it. And uh, so I want to talk about some things that have been on my mind for a while. And there come a few things that are coming from different directions. Uh, but I think they all tie together. So hopefully, uh, let's see, you can see my beautiful, lovely screen there with my beautiful, lovely uh, title. And uh, uh, one thing I'm going to start with because it's part of the theme, whoops, let me go back, is uh, this quote, uh, which is possibly an unusual source to quote from if you're talking about uh, the tradition of the Enlightenment, because Nietzsche was very much uh, against the tradition of the Enlightenment. Uh, but this, I think, is a very important uh, idea that uh, one repays a teacher badly if one always remains nothing but a pupil, uh, because that's part of the problem I'm going to be talking about. Um, so these are going to be sort of the main points. I'm going to be going back and forth between my beautiful slides and uh, my, uh, well, my mug. And uh, the first thing that I want to talk about, the curse of the disciples, this is a very specific problem that's sort of been weighing on my uh, mind for some time. And the idea of the curse of the disciple is this. There are any member, any number of uh, seminal thinkers, groundbreaking thinkers, thinkers whose ideas have uh, changed things, whether it's in politics, whether it's in economics and science or technology, uh, that have been brilliant. Uh, all of these uh, thinkers, I'm going to use the term master somewhat ironically uh, when I talk about them. But like anybody else, these masters have some groundbreaking ideas, some amazing insights or uh, extremely important critiques about uh, the society they're living in or the state of the discipline that they're in, cosmology or biology, whatever the case may be. And uh, they're thoughts change a lot of things for the better, push open new uh, directions of thought, new directions of research, new directions uh, for human rights, for democracy, whatever the case may be. But all of these masters with all of those good ideas, first of all, also have bad ideas. There isn't a single one who doesn't also have bad ideas. And it's also the case that a lot of the ideas that they have that are groundbreaking, that are important, that do push things forward are very time bound. So if they're thinking about it in 1750 or in 1848, it was very important for them to come out with it at the time and it changed things in an important way. But looking back at somebody who was writing in 1750 from 2022, you also have to have a certain perspective. If you think, ah, everything they said in 1750 is applicable today, you're probably 
not doing enough uh, homework and enough observation. Um, but these thinkers have a legacy. These thinkers, uh, you know, should be looked up to. But part of the problem that uh, you have is that when you do have one of these thinkers, they're often surrounded by disciples who are attracted by the uh, excitement uh, of their ideas, by the potential of their ideas. And uh, that isn't always the best thing that can happen to you. And what I'm arguing is that in more cases than not, having disciples is a curse. Because what disciples do is they take your ideas and they turn them into stone. A new idea is supposed to spawn new thought. It's supposed to push things forward, create a new momentum, and people take the next step and the next step and the next step. But what disciples tend to do is to freeze those ideas in place and they create them into an ideology, into a set of sacred doctr doctrines that may not be um, uh, tested, that may not be examined. Uh, anybody who tries to do so is obviously either totally uninformed or even worse is a heretic and in the worst cases uh, has to be suppressed or has to be gotten rid of. And this does happen any number of times. Um, so part of the problem then is when this happens, it's often the case that the new orthodoxy that the disciples have created actually has negative ramifications. Sometimes they're somewhat serious. Uh, they might stifle research in a scientific discipline uh, or cause unnecessary strife that interferes with the progress of the discipline. Uh, but in some cases, it can lead to dictatorial regimes. It can lead to the suppression of human rights, to atrocious human rights uh, violations. So I'm going to here show two of the, uh, whoops, let me get there, uh, two such ideas. So for example, uh, the first quote on the left by Karl Marx, who is uh, an example of somebody who is very poorly served by his disciples as was uh, a large part of humanity. Uh, if anything is certain, it is that I myself am not a Marxist. He wrote this responding to two French radicals uh, who were calling themselves Marxists, and they were disrupting uh, a lot of the uh, political activity of a variety of uh, socialists and progressives and uh, militants in France. Uh, and one of the things that Ged and Lafargue uh, did was they viciously attacked people who wanted to pursue political reform as a policy as opposed to violent revolution. And they tried to ostracize them. And Karl Marx says, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I'm saying. Don't call yourself a Marxist. If, if that's what it is to be a Marxist, I'm certainly not a Marxist. And that sort of an example of, of Marx rejecting his disciples while he was still alive. On the other hand, you have a quote by Adam Smith, which is not the only quote like this, uh, but a lot of people who claim Adam Smith as a master uh, who uh, believes in unbridled uh, market capitalism, which he didn't, uh, would be surprised at this. It is not very unreasonable that the rich should contribute to the public expense, not only in proportion to their revenue, the revenue but something more, more than, than in that proportion. Meaning, yeah, you got to tax the rich and you got to tax the rich proportionately and possibly even a little bit more, which is anathema to a lot of the people who claim Adam Smith as their uh, master.
master. Adam Smith was also a moral philosopher. Um, he was very good at analyzing uh, markets. He came up with the classic uh, idea of the invisible hand of the market, but he in no way intended that to be uh, universal, universally applicable and an iron uh, law. It's something that works. It's something that's always there, but it's also something that is always uh, modified, that is always impinged upon, etc. So uh, these are two examples of the kind of thing I'm talking about. And it doesn't matter if you agree with Smith or you agree with Marx. The point is, what did the disciples of Marx and Smith and any number of other people do to their ideas and their doctrines? Uh, and much of it is a major distortion. So at any rate, uh, that's what I meant by the curse of the disciples. And I can think of any other, uh, any number of other uh, ideas uh, or people whose ideas have also sort of been uh, distorted. Freud is another person who comes to mind. Uh, the Enlightenment as a whole is something that comes to mind, and that's going to be a theme of uh, another section of this uh, talk. But at any rate, uh, this is what I mean by the curse of the disciples. It's true of a variety of uh, thinkers. It's true of religious thinkers. I would certainly say that it's true of Jesus, whatever you may think of Jesus, I can't possibly imagine that he would have uh, approved of the Inquisition or approved of the, the religious wars that were fought in his name, et cetera. Um, the model, the ideal model, uh, in some sense, uh, from ancient times, is the model of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Socrates. Uh, arguably, Socrates didn't really have firm fixed doctrines or firm fixed uh, program. Uh, he did have a method. He did have the Socratic method. And his method was anybody who says they're an expert on something, you quiz them, you drill them, you try and find out whatever wisdom you possibly can from them. And if they don't produce the wisdom, well, you show them why they're wrong, uh, which I think is uh, even valid in uh, 2,500 years after he lived. Uh, Plato was his disciple. Plato was certainly devoted. And Plato did, uh, at least for a while, adopt his method. But Plato went on to take steps in new directions. And he covered a lot of ground that Socrates didn't cover. And you could even uh, make the argument that Socrates wouldn't have agreed with a lot of the things that Plato came up with. But that's not the point. Plato didn't stop, freeze everything that Socrates said and said, that's the only thing that could be possibly true. He moved things forward. Aristotle was Plato's student. Aristotle uh, started out accepting a lot of Plato's ideas. But then Aristotle looked around, did a lot of empirical research and said, uh, Plato's not right on a lot of this stuff. And then he moved forward, uh, very impressive body of work, but he didn't freeze Plato's ideas either. That should be the model. That's how progress is made. In the 20th century, uh, 20th century science, especially uh, chemistry, quantum mechanics, cosmology, astronomy, things like that. There is such a dynamism that uh, as soon as one discovery is made, people rushed out and tried to see if they would produce uh, results, produce, uh, they would make predictions based on them. They would confirm or reject the, uh, the the theory based on the empirical data, but things moved forward in the 20th century faster than they had ever moved before because the scientific community didn't reestablish a hardcore orthodoxy of the kind that the disciples of Aristotle did that held sway for over a thousand years. So there are models of how it should work. But there are too many models of what 
you shouldn't do in uh, this case. So at any rate, that's my part one. Um, my part two, uh, I want to talk about ideology and I'm gonna be uh, very political science-y here. And I, uh, at one time was studying ideologies uh, in general and uh, military ideology in particular. Uh, but I have to explain uh, how I'm going to use the terms because there is a term ideology we all use. We all sort of know what it means. We can pick it out when we see it. Um, but when you really dig in, you, uh, you see that there are uh, different ways to approach the idea. So I'm going to distinguish between two types or two categories of ideology. Uh, one I'm going to call group ideology and the other I'm calling articulated ideology. Uh, the one I'm calling group ideology technically in political science terms it would be called corporate ideology but the word corporate is used in an entirely different sense than most people are used to using so it would just confuse the issue so I'm going to say group ideology. Uh, the idea of group ideology is based on the idea that in effect, everybody has an ideology, very loosely defined. Everybody has a set of beliefs that they go back to. And those beliefs are based on what they get from their parents, what they get from their school, what they get from their peers, what they get from television and movies and uh, online. Uh, what they get from living in a certain milieu. It, it can depend on what country you're in. It can depend on what social class you're in. It could depend on the religious group you belong to, the ethnic group you belong to. Uh, it's a whole mishmash of sources, but it produces a set of ideas that you have. And some of those you just sort of get randomly. Some of those are targeted when you're in school and you say the Pledge of Allegiance every day. The reason that you say the Pledge of Allegiance every day is because society wants to socialize you into having a certain relation to the country. That's what they're doing. There's an intent behind that. And that feeds into personal ideology. Some people accept it more. For some people, it doesn't mean anything, but but it's there. It's going on. When you have sort of, well, when you are an adult, by the time you are an adult, there's still more that's going on. And part of your corporate idea or your group ideology will be, on the one hand, what determines, to a certain extent, what kind of job, what kind of profession you're going to be involved with. Or on the other hand, when you get into that profession, that profession is going to socialize you more. That profession is going to have principles, ideas, beliefs, expectations. And other people that have come to that profession have come there because they're attracted by those beliefs. But it's still somewhat diffuse. So uh, to give you some examples of what I mean, uh, an example, since I mentioned it, I studied military ideology. It tends to be the case in the 20th and 21st century, tends to be the case that people in the military in Western advanced democratic uh, capitalist countries People in the military, people who make a profession of the military, mainly mili military officers, tend to be more conservative than the average citizen in their society. It tends to be the case that military officers are likely, notice I say likely, to be more conservative. Why is that the case? Well, first of all, a lot of people are drawn to it, a strong sense of patriotism, a strong sense of duty. Uh, and so they expect patriotism and duty from others. They also tend to value order and 
nothing is more orderly, at least in a formal way, than the military, you know, with all of the ranks and all of the deference that goes with it, et cetera, very strongly enforced. And you have this idea of following command, following the orders. The general says something, then the, the colonels hop to it, and then they tell the majors, who tell the, the captains all the way down, and you do what you are told. And that kind of order, that kind of respect for authority tends to color your general view. You tend to value order in society at large. And you tend to be very upset with people who don't value order, who cause trouble. Well, what, what do you mean you're going out and protesting? Uh, no, no, no. Come on. Just, you know, go to work. Be good. Yeah, go out to vote. Write a letter to the editor. Don't cause trouble. And respect the, the order in society. But not every military officer is politically conservative. There are liberal military officers. And you don't get kicked out if you're a liberal. You're just, it's just more likely to attract people who, are more, who have more conservative values, little c conservative. And it also socializes you into that value. If you go to another group, it tends to be the case that trial lawyers in America are liberals, OK? And if you go and you become a trial lawyer, you are socialized into a certain view of the system, uh, a certain view with how law works, a certain view that says lawyers are the most important people on earth. Uh, and you're attracted for a certain reason, but those reasons that attracted you in the first place get strengthened through the socialization of becoming a lawyer. Uh, just an example, uh, there was a period I had after uh, I finished my bachelor's degree, I took several years doing other things uh, before I decided I was going to go back to graduate school. And for about 12 minutes, I considered possibly going to law school. Uh, which would have thrilled my father. But uh, one of the things that changed my mind, because at the time I was very politically active, uh, you know, and, and wanted to do good and change the world, and whatever. Uh, I had read a survey that had been done at Harvard Law School. And what they had done was they took an incoming class of law students and they polled the students and asked them, what kind of law do you want to do once you've got your law degree? And the incoming class, there were people who wanted to do uh, public defender. There were people who wanted to work for nonprofits. There were people who wanted to do civil rights work. There were people who wanted to work in environmental affairs, etc. And then they followed the whole class. And as that same class graduated, they polled them again, over 80% wanted to go into corporate law. Okay, something happened at law school. Well, it was the money, but also the socialization that went on at law school. You're sort of, uh, you're in there, you're in sort of this pressure pot, and then you get out and uh, it sort of changes your view uh, of the world. And one more, if I took one more example and I talked about social workers, somebody who is going to become a social worker, uh, that might be the total opposite of uh, somebody who wants to make a profession out of the military. You're likely to think, ah, every single person has to be treated as an individual. You can't assume that uh, John is going to be treated the way as Susan is going to be treated the way as Phil is going to be treated the way as Margaret. Um, and and you, you have a very generous view of society and of people's faults and, and trying to get people to learn this way. And you got to be gentle with some and you can't just come down uh, hard and it chances are if you've gone into social work you're politically liberal but not every social worker is a liberal you don't get thrown out of the profession if you don't have all of those characteristics 
that uh, most people have. But that's a group ideology. It's loose. It's a set of behaviors. It's a set of expectations. It's a set of beliefs that you can sort of predict from different groups. And it, I, I've talked about professional groups. Could be ethnic groups. Could be social groups, national groups. Um, but you observe and you say, well, most of the people in this group act a certain way, believe a certain way. That's the way it is. OK, uh, so you observe it. Articulated ideologies are what we usually refer to as ideologies. And articulated ideologies, like it says, you articulate, ah, I am a libertarian, and therefore, as a libertarian, I believe A, B, C, D. Uh, uh, government interference is always bad, and there shouldn't be any regulation at all. Uh, but the government also doesn't have a right to interfere with your personal choices, et cetera, et cetera. And it's there, and you get the libertarian brochure, and it's got all of the planks down there. Or somebody's a socialist, you know what it means. Well, depends on which kind of socialist they are, because there's only 435 versions, uh, but you've got the party planks. You've got the rules. This is what it means to be a socialist. This is what it means to be a green. This is what it means to be uh, a social democrat. Uh, this is what it means to be a fascist. This is what it means to be a nationalist. And you know what it means. And if you don't accept most of the things in the book or the brochure, you get thrown out of the party. You get pushed out of the movement. You've got to believe that stuff. It's very clearly defined and argued. Um, so it's an articulated ideology. One thing we should always be aware of, and I see this mistake being made by political scientists as well as uh, you know general public, um, there are periods when ideology is much more important uh, and more people are saying, yes, I'm this, yes, I'm that. And uh, everybody who's not me is is terrible. And uh, everybody who doesn't belong to my movement is wrong, etc. cetera. Um, but even when you have a situation like that, the average person is not ideological in that sense. The average person doesn't think five hours a day. What does it mean to be a social democrat? Am I truly a social democrat? Or maybe we should add this to the program. or I should do some more reading and find out uh, more about some libertarian thinkers or, or something like that. Most people aren't ideological in that way, even if for a while they are moved or persuaded by a political leader or a political party, uh, or if they think change is necessary so they found uh, uh, the movement that they want to be behind. Uh, most of those people are responding to some of the aspects of the ideology, uh, but they're really responding to the needs they have at the moment or the fears that they have at the moment that happen to have been captured by those people who are really, really tied in with the uh, articulated ideology. So um, let's see if I can get this out. So anyway, uh, Not yet. There we go. Um, so anyway, those are important to keep in mind. Now, an articulated ideology is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's very easy to turn it into a bad thing. It's very easy to make this into that very kind of orthodoxy that I was talking about with the curse of the disciple. Uh, Every political party has to have an ideology. Most political parties, especially, you know, the, the Republicans, that well, at the moment, it's a very unusual situation. But usually, the Republican and Democratic parties have been big tent parties with a whole bunch of different groups that have a whole bunch of different uh, uh, values. Uh, a lot of the people that line up behind the Democrats or behind the Republicans are really one issue people. They're not buying the whole package. They're a Democrat because they're really interested in women's issues, or they're a Democrat because they're really interested in environmental issues, or they're a Democrat because they're really uh, interested in civil rights or something like that. Uh, and you can say the same for uh, most Republicans before, let's say, the last 10 years. We won't get into that. Um, but still, the articulated ideology can and often has 
been turned into something uh, of a monolith of an orthodoxy that can't be challenged. Uh, and it's usually in desperate times that that articulated ideology does become uh, an impediment to progress and can become something very, very uh, dangerous. So um, at the moment, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm about halfway through, but are there any questions or clarifications that anybody wants to ask me now? OK. And I can't tell how many of you are asleep because a lot of you don't have. Oh, well, well, David, I, I, I've got something for you. Um, you and you might be doing this as you move forward, explaining further the word dangerous. OK. okay. And why is, is this kind of thing dangerous that you're talking about? And who, I mean, uh, we can look at Stalin and we can look at all of the atrocities and the genocides that have happened right. based on ideology. That's, that's right. a given. Right. We can see what's happening in, in the Ukraine. And if, if that's your response, I get that. But, it, right. but we're also right. talking to us that on a personal level. Right. So the, the distinction, why is it dangerous for an individual as opposed to the global results of what you're talking about? Speak to us if you can relative to an individual. Okay. And um, okay, I'm only going to do that briefly because I am sort of going to get back to that and also mention what you had mentioned. Uh, you don't earlier. have to do it now. But you pay out, you, you okay. Can just pay. I, I'll okay. pay that out later uh, if you okay. don't mind. Uh, right. I don't mind. I'll bring it up later because it is going to uh, come out. Uh, but I have a particular, I mean, some of this, you know, most people are going to say, well, yeah, okay. Um, but I want to. Uh, focus on it uh, from a particularly uh, free thought and uh, let's say enlightenment uh, set of uh, binoculars in a moment. So all right, David, anyway. I, all right. We, Mary is going to ask a question and then we're going to move on after Mary. Mary, okay. go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm sort of um, curious about um, clarification with regard to articulated ideology and the idea of separation of church and state. What's religion and what's propaganda with regard to articulated um, ideology or whatever? Okay, well, actually religion is uh, an example of an articulated ideology. If you are a uh, Catholic or if you are a Methodist or you are an Orthodox Jew, whatever, there are rules that you follow and you know what it is and uh, you get in trouble if you don't follow it. Now, maybe you get in trouble with God and you won't know actually what's going to happen until you die. Uh, but the idea is there are rules you follow if you want to be a good member of the group and you can be expelled. You you know, the church has excommunicated, excommunicated a lot of people uh, in its time. So, um, so that's an example of uh, an articulated ideology. The rules are there, they're, they're very clear. Uh, in terms of separation of church and state, that, that would be when religion sort of bleeds over into uh, politics, because there are uh, religious groups who, or religious leaders who support separation of church and state, uh, and there are those who want to impose their religious beliefs on society and on the state. But, you know, I, I have known uh, Catholics who support separation of church and state, and Catholics who they want to get in there and they want to pass the laws and they want prayer in the school, etc. So, uh, then you sort of cross over into more pure political uh, territory. So it depends. Uh, there are some uh, religious traditions, there are some Muslim religious, religious traditions who conceptually do not understand the idea of separation of church and state. It doesn't make sense within their particular uh, framework of belief and ideology. Um, but you would have to go, you know, to each different case uh, to see that. So. Yeah, a lot of religions have doctrine, but sometimes the line between, I guess, where a religion stands on the political issue and its doctrine seem to 
you know, bleed a little bit or something. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. Okay. And, and it's also different from religion to religion. Catholicism has doctrines. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a doctrine in Unitarianism. You know, so uh, there's a broad range of possibilities. Okay. Um, so where I want to go to from here is to specifically talk about uh, certain specific ideologies from a free thought perspective. And to me, and we can argue about this later, although I think most people would agree, to be a free thinker is to, some, is to be somebody who is uh, enjoying living with the legacy of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment wasn't a political, scientific, philosophical movement that produced doctrines. It was a political, scientific, philosophical movement that advocated procedures that were meant to be perpetuating. They, the, the assumption was you keep following this out and a hundred years from now, anybody who was in the enlightenment in the late 1700s knew they wouldn't recognize what uh, was around uh, 200 years later because it would have progressed that much. It wasn't meant to be something that was frozen. It wasn't meant to be a set of doctrines that would never change. That very idea is a violation of the principles of the Enlightenment, and it's a violation of the principles of free thought. Uh, to be a free thinker is to accept the idea that everything has to be examined, that there are no ideas that are sacrosanct, that are um, immune from examination and debate. Um, and uh, this is the thing, I believe uh, free thinkers would argue, that accounts for the progress that has occurred, especially in science, especially in technology, especially in medicine, but also in politics in the last 200 years. Capitalism, the good parts and the bad parts, but the idea of capitalism is an enlightenment idea. Liberalism broadly construed, I'm not talking about the way we use the word liberal and conservative in America, I'm talking about in general, liberalism, which is the political ideology of capitalism, uh, is an enlightenment idea. Uh, the progress uh, in human rights, the idea that everybody has rights, everybody has civil rights, is an enlightenment idea. Uh, it's not a doctrine. You don't, you don't only have civil rights this way, but not this way. The constitutions that have been produced in all of the liberal democracies, it's not a mistake that they're called liberal democracies, each one defines uh, citizenship, each one defines rights, each one defines uh, duties of the citizen somewhat differently, but that's part of the ongoing experiment of enlightenment ideas and I would say free thought uh, goes with that. Now, the problem I'm specifically concerned with, I'm not concerned with what happens with the Catholics. I'm not concerned with what happens with other religious groups. I'm not concerned with what happens with groups who reject the Enlightenment at this moment in this talk. Uh, I'm obviously concerned about fascists who you know, want nothing to do with the Enlightenment or uh, you know, other groups, deconstructionists, who, who knows. What I'm concerned about are the people who use the language of the Enlightenment to advance and justify ideologies that are anti-Enlightenment and anti-free thought. And that's where you come up with Stalin and Mao, uh, who are using a ossified, petrified version of well, it's not even Marxism because it's Marxism-Leninism, and in my mind, Lenin, uh, Lenin went in his own uh, direction. Um, and those have been used not only as a justification for the atrocities that they carried out, 
But the thing that really concerns me is the extent to which they were very dominant at one time, uh, dominant ideas uh, among people in the West who who subscribe to free thought and enlightenment ideas because official marxism leninism official communist doctrine is secularist it does have a critique of uh organized religion and on paper we might not disagree with what was written but it was but in actual fact i don't i certainly hope nobody in uh this meeting much as you are probably mostly free thinkers uh object to religious ideas the imposition of religion idea uh, religious ideas on everybody else that not one of you would think well the solution is to deprive religious people of their rights let alone to send them to siberia or whatever else uh the case may be that doesn't follow and that's not the way uh, a free thinker would think but that's the most extreme one. But there are other groups that did the same thing. Uh, libertarians. Libertarians are a group that came out of the Enlightenment. And uh, what I usually describe the libertarian, how I usually describe the libertarians when I talked about them in class, is they are fundamentalist liberals. And there are absolutes in their ideology. And you, government interference in the economy, it's a, it's just, I mean, it's a crime. You can't do that. Uh, never mind that there isn't a single society on earth that could function according to libertarian principles, capital L. I'm not talking about people with libertarian tendencies. I'm talking about the true believer uh, libertarians. Um, but it has been made into a system of belief. Uh, there are other things too, Freudianism. So uh, interesting, I've been studying a little bit of the uh, Freudian movement uh, and Freud himself is uh, somewhat guilty of this, uh, but the Freudian movement, which claims to be scientific, uh, claims to be at the forefront of science the Freudians of the late 1800s, early 1900s would organize conferences and seminars and they would choose who they would invite and they wouldn't invite anybody to the conferences, to a supposedly scientific conference, who they thought would raise objections to the principles that had already been laid down by Freud's psychoanalytic society. And that's not science. And not only is that not science, but later on as it developed, first of all, there were Freudian disciples who broke off and sort of founded their own uh, little groups that also became ossified and also became, this is the only way to do it. Right. Um, but it's but totally unscientific. And yet they're parading as people who are the embodiment of science. This is the way science goes. So it goes from things with uh, some negative consequences, might be negative com consequences in treatment of uh, people, might be horribly negative consequences like uh, Stalinist regime and the Maoist regime. Um, uh, and it, to a certain extent, relies on people who are attracted to the scientific idea and attracted to the secular idea that these ideologies put forward and yet the practitioners of these ideologies suppress some of the most important parts so that's the thing that has always puzzled me has always troubled me tremendously is how many different kinds of movements have used the free thought and enlightenment ideas when they were being exactly not free thinkers and scientific. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you, and I'm going to share the screen, it's a short uh, YouTube video, but I think it's uh, going to be 
instructive. Let's see if I can get there. All right, it's not gonna let me do it right. One, two, there we go. Okay, this is uh, Alan Greenspan uh, in a uh, congressional hearing uh, being uh, interviewed by Representative uh, Waxman. And let me find the place. Yeah, okay. I can't. I can't. You have to unmute your mics to hear it. Well, maybe not. Not. No, not. 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 <laughs> right. Uh, well, that's. Uh, we, we have to talk to our technical advisors about this. Yeah, it's, a, it's pretty yeah. low. Okay, yeah, um, I don't like Dylan Green spamming. Uh, that's part of my point. <laughs> uh, oh, so oh. You, you, you couldn't hear it? No. 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 Okay. I no, could hear it hear. only if I turn my uh, speakers up full blast. Oh, okay. What should I do, Madeline? Um, I don't know if it's because you have the headphones in, if that's interfering with that um i'm not entirely sure should i take my headphones out you want to try it that way yeah maybe just unplug it see how that goes all right let me get it back to where i want it okay let me try that okay, i don't hear anything no no that's what we heard could you caption it? Yeah, if you um, click on that little CC at the bottom, kind of on the right. This? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want the uh, closed captioning then? Yeah, right. All right, we'll give that a try. It's only three I'll minutes, so. Yeah. Right. I'll also put the link to this video in the chat, so if people want to watch it later, yeah. they can. Okay, yeah. give it one more try. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Everybody okay. else, mute, mute your mics if they're not already muted. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so in the end, Greenspan sort of said what I said. Everybody had an ideology, but he said, well, there was a flaw in mind that caused an international economic crisis that threw hundreds of thousands of people out of their jobs and out of their homes. But he was working on theory as opposed to, you know, what's supposed to happen. Uh, in in those terms, for example, the uh, the World Bank and the uh, World Trade Organization ha uh, and the IMF 
uh, run in large part according to uh, Greenspan's uh, ideology that had a flaw. And for years and years and years, when they were telling countries, uh, developing countries, how to develop their economies in order to uh, industrialize and come up to the level of uh, Western countries, they had a whole list of things that you had to do, which included you had to shrink the size of government, you had to cut subsidies, you had to cut quotas, uh, you had to cut taxation, you had to cut regulation. And uh, the countries that succeeded the best and the fastest were the countries that did exactly the opposite. And I'm thinking mainly of South Korea and uh, Taiwan, who uh, controlled all credit, controlled where all uh, investment was going to go according to the priorities of the uh, government uh, and uh, controlled and suppressed uh, labor unions because Part of the idea of, uh, of the Washington Consensus, as it was called, was uh, you're supposed to expand uh, democracy. Uh, they did every single thing that the IMF and the WTO said not to do, and they succeeded more and faster than any other country. And other countries that started to do that did well for a while. They weren't as uh, smart or clever as the leaders of Taiwan and South Korea and usually got uh, stopped and bottlenecked. And there were other things that happened uh, too, uh, to derail them. Uh, and uh, you'll hear a lot of talk these days about how much uh, of a reduction in absolute poverty has occurred in the last 10, 15 years. Even uh, Steven Pinker, uh, a lot of my ideas about this uh, are influenced by Steven Pinker. Uh, even he didn't uh, really touch on this aspect of it. Uh, the huge proportion of those people who have been lifted up out of poverty are in China. Well, China is not following the Washington consensus either. They have a uh, very strange sort of hodgepodge of uh, authoritarian uh, central control and uh, what you might call state capitalism with certain uh, parts of the economy uh, allowed to work more freely than other parts of the economy, but they aren't following the orthodoxy. And somehow they're getting ahead uh, and yet that orthodoxy remains in the uh, World Trade Organization and the IMF, who are presumably using these liberal free market concepts, uh, but they tend to use them in a sort of frozen uh, way. There was a uh, book by a former member of the World Bank, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, civil, uh, development and his discontents, who was talking about exactly how uh, the, World Trade, the World Trade Organization and the uh, IMF had a one size fits all program for uh, every developing country, even though it's very, very clear that every country has a, uh, has different needs and different backgrounds and different uh, resources, etc. So, that is my main concern with this talk is that there are a lot of different kinds of orthodoxies that are bad. Some are horribly bad and some are just, you know, holding back progress, etc. But the ones that I'm concerned about here are the ones that speak the language of free thought and speak the language of the uh, enlightenment which sort of make them attractive, but they don't practice what free thought and what the enlightenment really says that they ought to do. And uh, to a certain extent that points out that there's a lot of work 
uh, aside from just worrying about uh, the imposition of religious ideas and religious behaviors and religious policies uh, on society in general, that as free thinkers, we need to be more alert to other groups, including those who sound like they would be groups we should work with or be on our side. Uh, but in fact, they're not really as open uh, as they should be, open to debate, uh, open to progress, open to uh, discussion, um, the way that uh, we would advocate. So that's basically uh, where I'm going with this. The uh, emphasis that we have and that free thinkers have seems to always be on uh, religion and only religion. Uh, and I think our focus should be uh, much greater. Um, I have one PS, this is a slightly uh, on a tangent. Uh, there's a problem with this because, you know, when you're, when you're struggling against orthodoxies, you're, you're criticizing orthodoxies, you're criticizing establishments, people get very uh, excited about that, that uh, lone voice who's going up against the establishment, going up against the scientific establishment. We got a lot of that going on uh, these days, going up against uh, the economic or political establishment. Um, and it tends to be the case that too many people think, ah, the lone voice, the brave person, the person who's willing to put it all in the line uh, to fight the powers that be. Uh, undoubtedly, that's where a lot of good ideas come from or a lot of necessary reform comes from. But it's also the case that about 99% of those lone voices are wrong. And they may be just as goofy or goofier uh, than anybody else. Uh, it's also the case that you can have an excellent critique of what's going on. This is exactly what's wrong with policy X or policy Y. But the fact that you have a brilliant critique of policy X and policy Y doesn't mean that your suggestion about policy A is going to work at all. Your good critique doesn't exempt your alternative policy from rigorous scrutiny and it should not be assumed that because you were right about what was wrong what was going wrong that your alternative uh, is automatically uh, worthwhile so anyway i'm going to leave it uh, there, I'm sure I could ramble on for a little bit more, but um, at any rate, these are things that have been on my mind and have been trying to to pull them together for some time. And uh, anyway, so I hope. Well, thank, thank you, David. Um, you, you've shown that you have a conclusion or you're okay. leaving the conclusion up to the discussion. I don't know, but I, I personally have enjoyed this whole process of you showing us what you think about all of the dangers, you use the word, relative to individuals subscribing to certain ideologies and the problems that that creates. Um, and, and so many more things that you, 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 you talked about. We're going to open this up to questions. But you, you, the lab, one of the last things you said that 99% of the lone voices are wrong. Right? Yeah. All right. That's, that's not a scientifically arrived at number, but it's no right. right. But you, 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 but from your perspective, and, and right. that's part of what interests me. I'm interested in not so much. Per, this is me personally now. I, I'm interested in individuals as opposed to the global effect of a, of a congregation of individuals. Right. right. So, if somebody were to ask me, uh, well, who and what? do you subscribe to in terms of a, of a philosopher? I, I might tell them, and this could change from month to month, I might say, you know, I'm an Epicurean, so Socratic, uh, right. Marxist, Epicurean, so Socratic Marxist, and by Marxist, I don't mean Carl, I mean Groucho, Chico, and Harpo. Okay. And, and those three together, and I have a good life. I, I, I'm having lots of laughs and uh -huh. whatever 
you've got knowledge coming in and enjoying the good wine and the food. All right. So if I were to ask you to name three who have influenced you in terms of the philosoph philosophers, how would you respond? Um, that's a very good uh, question. And it would be a little bit more esoteric, partly because my undergraduate degree is in philosophy. So I'm, I would mention philosophers that aren't widely known. Uh, and even though I've changed over the time, uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, when I started my undergraduate degree and I picked philosophy, my intent was to eventually become a reform rabbi, OK? But by the time I finished my degree, oh, that was, that, oh, no, nothing, nothing like that. And it had to do with a variety of different uh, philosophies that I encountered. Probably the most important were uh, what were called the logical positivists and British linguistic analysis. The, the biggest names associated with them would have been Ludwig Wittgenstein, the most famous unknown philosopher of the 20th century, uh, and, and some other people, but, but names that are generally known by people who study philosophy. But, but they had a tremendous influence on me and also some professors uh, there. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons that they were so influential, and I still feel it now, is they insisted that you know, somebody comes up with a claim, a philosophical claim, you know, spirit resides in this, or uh, we are here, but we are facing the eternal nothingness or whatever. You're supposed to say, okay, tell me what this nothingness is, especially since nothingness means no things and no thing can have characteristics. So you're telling me that no thing is a thing that I have to be worried about. Well, that's what is known in philosophy as bullshit, okay? It's just, it doesn't mean anything, but people are swept away by it. I mean, that's, you know, that's uh, Heidegger all yeah. over the place, you know, it's, yeah. so, yeah. so anyway, so that's, that's part of it. But um, I have, uh, even though I like, Groucho. Uh, I've been somewhat influenced by Marx and some uh, Marxists, but I never called myself a Marxist. Right. Uh, it's just some of the stuff makes sense. Some of the stuff is outmoded. Um, and, uh, and, and I could, you know, I have some other arguments on, on that thing. I don't think uh, everybody wants to hear about Marx all night. Um, but it's not, I was never a Marxist, you know, I was never drawn to that. As a matter of fact, in my political activities, the most annoying people to work with were Marxist Leninists. I mean, they would come in and they would just try and take over the meeting. They would try and take over the movement. They'd try and take over the protest uh, because there was only one way to do it. And all the rest of us kind of, you know, liberal and, uh, uh, you know, bleeding hearts and, and uh, whatever, uh, you know, didn't understand what really needed to be done. Ay, God, so annoying, yes. you know. Well, okay, well, we could talk, that, that's a whole nother discussion, but let's go to Fred, Fred's got, and Mary had a, com, uh, her hand up, Mary Wall. Yeah, I, I don't know any more, problem. you know, I'll let, it, oh. let other people go first, whatever. Okay, we'll, let, we'll come back to you, Mary. Let's go Thank to Fred. You. Hey, um, there's that question about uh, people who switch from one strict ideology, you know, one guru to another, and go like right. a complete opposite, like, you, you might say um, Mussolini or something, because he is once a you know, socialist, and he became you know, his own movement. Right. But also these sort of people who, uh, well, was in, I had experience with Scientology before I discovered what I was really about, is trying to suck as much money out of me as I could. And right. just like everyone, as you're saying, Everyone follow this leader, just do exactly what he says. And I think anyone who insists on that, that's someone to stay away from. And somebody who insists on disciples don't really avoid, but yeah. there are people who go from one to another, one side to the other. 
right. Well, I've I've encountered that. You know, I have been in uh, a milieu. I said in between undergraduate and graduate, uh, I went off, but I actually was involved in a, uh, a socialist movement and a, a nationalist movement. I uh, went to Israel, lived on a kibbutz, uh, et cetera, and we had a reputation for being fairly uh, left wing. Uh, but, you know, we had arguments about what it all meant among ourselves. Uh, but I remember one time, uh, you know, when you're on a kibbutz, you, uh, you want to recruit new members to the kibbutz, but you, you know, you have to try them out uh, a little bit. And we had a reputation, like I said, being very activist kibbutz. And we had a guy show up who wanted to join our kibbutz because he heard that we were really activist kibbutz. Uh, but when he told his story, you know, he had started out uh, in high school as a Jew for Jesus, which is already for most Jews uh, problematic. Uh, and then somehow he got recruited by the ultra-Orthodox religious Jews. And so he was with them for a while. But then somehow he discovered Marxism. And that's what was really the truth. And by, you know, by the time uh, we heard that story, we were thinking, this guy is not stable. That's, that's not stable. He wasn't doing it through thought and analysis, he was doing it through an emotional need to have the absolute truth. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, is assuming you can have an absolute truth, you're already in trouble, as far as a free thinker is concerned. It's, you know, in principle, so David, would you say, would, you, would you say the truth is highly overrated? Uh, yes, yes. Capital T truth. It's right. highly overrated. You know, there are some truths, uh, uh, you know, that uh, uh, a Manhattan is the finest cocktail. Okay, that's a truth. All right. <laughs> but it's not the truth. The truth is that we're all on a mission and uh, we're all part of the great uh, super being. And, we, you know, people who are looking for truth with a capital T are searching for a black cat in a basement uh, that's shut off from all light without a candle. You know, it's, you're not going to find it. It's not there. You're just going to keep bumping into walls. Let's uh, go to Candace. Candace. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. First, thank you for presenting and thank you for, um, you have two ideas, and I'm sorry, I'm flaky. The second one, I can't articulate. Um, I, I really like your primary um, uh, point about the twisting of free thought. I'm a secular humanist as well as an a hard atheist, but um, the twisting of free thought and, and libertarianism um, and, and using words and language and concepts and ideologies um, that are actually um, the results and the meaning are the total opposite of what uh, either was meant or even what's the definition now. I've, no, I've not seen that point made anywhere. I think it's wonderful. Perhaps it's an approach, I'm a far left liberal, but it's an approach we could take to help dismantle this horrible present that we are in right now um, of the dominant um, uh, economic activity global right now anyway. But uh, so thank you for that. And also I think your second point, which unfortunately I, I can't articulate right now. But I'm sorry, I get flaky. Uh, that's so, that's all right. If you remember your question, then you know, speak up again, and I'll see if I can. Yeah. Well, the only question I had way back—it's not even necessarily needs to be addressed. You said something about um, the Enlightenment and free thought, and how it was. Well, you know what you said. So, but I thought that there were some parameters on it, such as using logic um, and reason. Right. I mean, that's how Hume and Locke 
came to you know human rights and uh, Rousseau later on came to civil society and all that they right. they applied logic principles and I think so it wouldn't that kind of all be like a rules of enlightenment or oh yeah uh, the idea of using rationality and logic is extremely important but yeah. you also have to understand the subtleties of it that's that's why I have a quote here I didn't show it before from Niels Bohr, who said to somebody, I'm not sure who, no, no, you're not thinking, you're just being logical. Meaning you can, you, you can decide, okay, these are the premises and this, and they're gonna lead me to this logical argument. And Bohr is saying, yeah, but does it apply here? Are there, are there things you can think of beyond? He's not talking about metaphysically. He's talking about other possible uh, ramifications. So you can get too lost in the formality of logic and miss some of the evidence around you that you also need to take into account. Um, and one of the problems there, uh, and I tried to show that with the clip with uh, Greenspan, is that you know people through rationality, through logic, build these theories and then they think the theories are what's right, not reality, but the theories. That's the problem with a lot of uh, social scientists, and I'm a social scientist, uh, but I criticize a lot of uh, fellow social scientists, especially, um, especially the uh, economists, because I think they're the worst at this, is they forget that a theory, a theory is an instrument. You, that theory is like, you know, to build a house, you need a hammer and you need a saw and you need, uh, uh, you know, a spirit level. You need all sorts of things. But if you only have one tool, if you only had a hammer, you're not going to build your house. You're not going to put the glass in the windows with your hammer. You're not going to cut the wood with your hammer. If all you are using is one instrument, you're off. A theory is an instrument and a theory is taking certain parts of reality into account to see how they work. And you can get a lot of good useful information like that. But your theory is not reality. The moment you plug your theory back into reality, reality is a mess. Reality is changing all the time. Every time you turn around, something else happens. That's why the uh, the idea of supply and demand, the, the Adam Smith model of supply and demand is valuable. Yeah. It works. It shows certain things. The key, though, is that it works. And this is the magic Latin word, ceteris paribus, all things being equal. You know what? Ceteris paribus doesn't exist anywhere in the real world. It only exists in theory. It only exists in a book. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So exactly. you have you have, you know, supply and demand. And if you leave supply and demand alone, you will eventually get equilibrium. The amount of people actually supplying the bread and the amount of people actually buying the bread is going to work out. For their own self-interest, also a very, very important insight on the part of Adam Smith. But in real life, there's always something interfering. You have taxation, you have a famine, you have a war, you have a boycott, you have uh, people cheating and distorting the system. You never get rid of it. So the, the market, the pure market, never, ever exists. That doesn't mean that market forces don't exist, but market forces aren't the only thing that determine price and availability. And, and Adam Smith knew that, but a lot of his disciples don't, like Alan Greenspan. Uh, Mary, Mary Wall. Okay, well, I'm not sure whether I should send to this is personal, I guess, um, thought rather than anything, I guess, um, you know, Oh, you know, overall, but it, my observation is that probably um, the lack of perfection is perfection, which is a paradox. Um, in terms of humanity, I guess people will return to Eden or exceptionality or quest for it. But you know, 
personally, I try to, I guess, defend my own humanity um, in terms of making a mistake or something. I know one time I, could, I became the secretary thinking, you know, well, I can't possibly screw this up, but, you know, all I can do is make a typo. Well, you know, basically you can. I guess you can have a career maybe as a mortician or something where you can't probably <laughs> screw something up. But, you know, um, anyway, um, it seems to me that all of, I guess, art, fine art, painting, um, literature, whatever, is based on humanity and the ability to admit that you're human instead of run away from fear of corporal being. Um, so, you know, um, I guess psychology has been referred to in my presence as soft science. It seems like Freud and I, Darwin were contemporaries or something and lived during the Victorian era and stuff like that. I, um, I hear they basically flogged piano lines during that time, I guess, because they considered that a risque or something. But, you know, um, sometimes running away from one's humanity seems to, you know, negate the entire prospect of living, even if basically life is sometimes, I guess, difficult or tough or cruel. So, you know, whatever, I hate to tend to walk a tightrope and maybe not do something more with my life than, you know, um, I may be able to do because I'm afraid of making a mistake or something. I see that sometimes, sometimes when somebody make, does a more difficult job or something, they're not insulated from making mistakes, you know, even by, I guess, relegating themselves to a life of, you know, more of a secretary or something. So I guess all this, like, it may, it may be in consideration people that weren't so gifted could never have sung or Einstein. I guess there's some, I guess, people that are born with mental retardation that in terms of a lifetime, never have the ability to do anything more than count to 10. And there are people that devote their lives to teaching them to do so, but I'm not sure out of consideration Einstein should have you know, more or less constrain himself just doing that in order to be considered somebody who may not have had that ability. So whatever. The, uh, the idea of, uh, like you said, some people can't even count to uh, 10 and you have uh, people to, uh, who have to take care of them who try and, and uh, help them to deal with life. Uh, to me, that's a very enlightenment kind of idea the idea of education and the idea of everybody has uh, rights even if they aren't einstein or even if they aren't an artist or even if they aren't uh an engineer who's going to contribute the idea that rights are universal and rights are universal whatever your religion is whatever your ethnic origin is uh, whatever your social class is and whatever your physical and mental abilities are um you know, to me, that's that's an important legacy, uh, also of the. Yeah, I, I, I seem to have encountered some idea on the part of some religious people that if God, according to their definition, you know, um, didn't exist, that people would not people go to the grocery store without, I guess, losing control and I guess I'm, you know, committing some horrible crime. I'm not really sure that that degree of micromanagement in terms of, you know, definition of an amoral atheist, because, you know, atheists that are that way, um, is really, um, you know, an accurate perception um, in terms, I guess, of extremes and good and bad. You're either right or you're wrong or whatever. So. Well, that's that's one of the things that's one of the things I wanted to answer. Not not that I think it's really uh a good argument against uh, secularism, but it's an argument that's used that I feel uh, secularists haven't answered, is that uh, uh, people who are against uh, humanism, people who are against secular uh, uh, thought, uh, do bring up, well, look, in the 20th century, you had uh, Stalin and you had Mao and they killed millions of people and you keep talking about how many people were killed by religion. And uh, usually, you know, the responses I hear are inadequate because it just goes back and they want to say, oh, yeah, but proportionately in history, that's beside the point. You still have Stalin and, uh, and Mao, but I don't consider them, uh, even though they use the language of the Enlightenment, I don't consider them as part of the legacy of the Enlightenment and, and a to, uh, instrument to use against the Enlightenment they are relying on uh, fanaticism and they are relying on uh, 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 crowd control and they are relying on propaganda and all sorts of things. Uh, and the way they get power has a lot to do with other people not examining their methods and their ideology enough who should 
uh, know better. Uh, the book that Holdy uh, had recommended uh, for the book club, uh, The Three-Body Problem by Liu Sishin, uh, I started listening to the first part of the book and it's describing uh, episodes in the Cultural Revolution, which was in the late 1960s, which was just a frenzy of fanaticism whipped up using, I think as an excuse, but using the official Maoist ideology as a reason to uh, suppress, humiliate, and, and in many cases, uh, kill people who were seen as insufficiently uh, revolutionary or loyal to the state. That had nothing to do with anything close to rationality, but it was used. But that fanaticism, it's that fanaticism that with the right demagogue and the right tools can be harnessed for anything. That's, that's the enemy and that's something that I think free thinkers have to spend more time on. That doesn't mean let down your guard uh, with uh, aggressive religious uh, uh, policies, but it means those aren't the only things we have to look at and those aren't the only things we have to analyze and be worried about. It's That's really my Nestle. point. Nestle at one point, I guess, alleged that water wasn't free. I guess they sell bottled water. I'm right. not only sure they said that basically, but there was that was their you know um, patent or you know thing they had to sell. But you know, in terms of religion or ideology, sometimes you know, there's some sort of guarantee that if you follow directions, you know, life is going to be perfect. Well, sometimes I guess if you end up in heaven or you don't end up in heaven, you know, basically in terms of contract law or whatever, you know, if it doesn't happen after death, who's going to sue and whatever. So um, anyway, in terms of it's the only acceptable definition of normal is basically exceptionality or perfection. You know, um, essentially in terms of humanity, there's a bell curve and a lot of people have something to offer where they're always the same thing. So yeah. anyway, I think somebody uh, else. Diane wanted to say something. Is yeah, something? First, first of all, how do you get the little raise your hand sign to show up? Oh, <laughs> uh, there's a button that says reactions at the bottom of your screen. I see that. Okay, I'll look for that. I, right. I've been in a lot of Zoom calls, but they don't have that. Okay, my question is, so isn't this, you know, follow, having followers and disciples, isn't that kind of like build it and they will come? I mean, what are you going to do about it? But, but wait, but it's kind of like it's going to happen, like gravity. It's almost like a law of physics that there's going to be disciples if you've got someone with an so can you give examples of people who were uh, leaders, wannabe demagogues or whatever, gods, whatever they were, who didn't, I mean, is Gandhi like, did he have disciples? He must have. I don't know enough about Gandhi. Okay. But do you have advice besides, you know, have <laughs> well, everyone yeah. becomes a free thinker, but how are we going to do that? But Right, right. Um, well, one one of the other quotes i'm not going to try and fool with the uh with the powerpoint anymore but one of the other quotes that i had uh which is a much more boring quote but actually to the point is one by kenneth uh john kenneth galbraith uh, and he said i react pragmatically where the market works i'm for that where the government is necessary i'm for that i'm deeply suspicious of somebody who says I'm in favor of privatization, uh, privatization, or I'm deeply in favor of public ownership. I'm in favor of whatever works in the particular case. So uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who is an extremely important person who had a lot to do with coming out of the depression and, and uh, reordering uh, uh, the economic system in Europe after World War II, um, you know, he wasn't, he, you know, he looked and said, this is what is needed, not, I have a theory, and I'm going to apply the theory everywhere there's a problem. So you're saying uh, pragmatism. You're saying testing, pragmatism. But that's just a model still. That's not an ideology. It's not an ideology, but it's an approach, you know, uh, Keynes had 
you could say followers. Uh, again, I'm using disciples in a negative sense, but he had followers. There is such thing as Keynesian economics, which was very powerful uh, in uh, the United States and in Western Europe in the 40s and 50s, which had a lot to do with the recovery of the economies in both uh, cases. And uh, so there were followers of Keynes, but the followers of Keynes didn't say, oh, I don't know what to do. Give me my book on Keynes. Let's look on page 84. That's where we'll find the answer. That's not what they said. They had a general outlook that said, we have a, a, a toolkit of possible cures or possible answers to the problems we have. And we'll rummage around in the toolkit and sometimes we'll use this tool and sometimes we'll use that tool. That's entirely different from somebody like Alan Greenspan or an organization like the World Trade Organization that says, every country has to do it this way. And this is the only way the theory is right, not reality. And it's reality's fault that my theory didn't work, not my theory's fault. I'm still stuck with What's this disciple thing. I mean, you're not saying it's wrong to have followers. You could list hundreds of examples oh, yeah. in history right. where without followers, you know, things wouldn't have happened. I okay. mean, you know, All right. George Washington. George Washington. Well, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an... Martin Luther King. I mean, did yes. is there an I, evil thing you see happening when a follower's goes over on the spectrum and becomes a disciple that's what you're saying is really dangerous or is it wrong to have followers and no it's not it's not wrong to have followers as long as your followers are not trying to make you into a hero and your doctrines into holy script okay so i'll give you i'm going to go back to to marx and i'll give you an example so you had marx uh, very influential. He was going around Europe uh, meeting with different working men's associations and different groups that were trying to form labor unions. And he was in Belgium and France and, and England, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and he did build up followers. He was very argumentative too, but there were a lot of uh, socialists and radicals who were not uh, Marxists. But one of the most important groups that was founded was, was the German Social Democratic Party. And the German Social Democratic Party in the early part of the 20th century considered itself Marxist. It called itself Marxist, but they weren't doing what Lenin was doing, who also considered himself Marxist. And Lenin was condemning the German Social Democratic Party for being bourgeois and uh, reformist or whatever. But what happened was, and this is interesting, this is my analysis and it's a little superficial the way I'm presenting it, but, but I think it gets to something. The German Social Democratic Party, which defined itself as a Marxist party, was working in the system. They had labor unions, they wouldn't have strikes, they would have protests, but they were also getting people elected to office. They also had people elected to uh, the parliament and they were changing laws. You've got to pay workers better. You've got to have medical uh, uh, insurance for workers. You have to uh, have safety things. And the condition of the workers improved because of the efforts of the Social Democratic Party of Germany in exactly the way that undid the revolutionary potential that Marx himself had been writing about. So the bigger success for the working class following Marx came about by those who said, yeah, we're inspired by Marx. He said a lot of great things, but you know what? We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do the other. And that's what improved. So uh, this whole idea that the workers' situation was gonna get worse and worse and worse and worse until it was intolerable and there would have to be a revolution. Well, the Marxist party actually made the situation better and better and better and better. So there was less incentive to have a revolution. But that's what should have happened. 
they took the original ideas, but they said, yeah, but now conditions are changed. And now we have new opportunities. And now we can do it this way and that way. We're not getting more desperate. Isn't that better? Yeah, that's better. So they weren't acting like Lenin, who was making it into sacred rules. They were saying, yeah, we're taking the idea and the inspiration, but you know what? We're experimenting. We're going to go this way. We're going to go that way. And we're going to do it our own way. So they're followers, but they weren't disciples in the SPD. But they became disciples in the Communist Party. Does that make sense? I, I, I'm just going to think about it some more, but I... I, I <laughs> The idea of how, you know, the disciples, do they lead to problems that's, that, or do they, can they lead to good or, or right. is it the calcification of becoming a disciple? It's like you turn right. into. I think, I think your distinction is good. And, and perhaps I should have made it, that would have made it better. I should have said, if you're the guy with the great ideas and you have followers, you're lucky. And how do you the, not turn them into this calcified mess? Right, right. So if you have disciples, it's a curse. If you have followers, that's what you want. So yeah. I, I actually like your distinction. If, if I had talked to you before I did this, I might have put that in. But I and, think you're uh, right. Isn't well, this the next time you do this. Slope, slippery slope. I'm sorry. I mean, I just... I'm right. well, 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 Diane, we, th th this is a great conversation, and, and, and I want you to continue to join us with the conversation, but I also want to open it up for other folks who have yeah. things, yeah. you know, to, to, to offer. Um, for yeah. example, I'm not sure David is watching the chat as they, as they, oh. as they scroll up around, but uh, somebody said earlier, isn't there a more basic issue here that we do not teach critical thinking? Mm -hmm. Oh, and, I, yeah. And, and, it, it, and, and she, she went on to say, and it starts with the fact that we don't allow our children to question adults or parents. But let's start with the idea of how do we, from your perspective, obviously, David, right. teach critical thinking. You're a professor. Yes, and, and teaching critical thinking uh, is uh, easier said than done. Uh, I was a professor at the university, and so part of the problem I had to deal with, not with every student, but with more than there should have been, is they had never been taught to think critically. So if you say, okay, read the chapter uh, in the textbook, and tell me what's wrong with it. Okay, that's a good exercise for a college student. But they never, most of them are like, what? It's in the textbook. It's right. What do you mean? Me tell you what's wrong with it. Me tell you I have a problem. I'm not asking them, what did you not understand? I'm asking, what did you disagree with? And, and they have never learned to disagree with anything and make a solid argument. So you have to go further and further uh, back. Now, you know, you're not going to get uh, fourth graders to discuss quantum mechanics and whether or not it's a theory that makes sense. But you can certainly lay out different kinds of problems and show them that, first of all, a variety of conclusions could be valid if you have followed certain kinds of rules and brought forth evidence. Uh, but certain kinds of arguments are not valid, not because they don't confirm the ideology, but because they didn't hold together. You didn't prove your point. You didn't use evidence properly. Um, but it's very hard to do. And there's a lot of resistance on the part of parents. Uh, not that long ago in Texas, uh, in the legislature, they had said that they didn't want critical thinking taught uh, before a certain grade. I can't remember if it was eighth grade or ninth grade or whatever. I mean, that's ridiculous. 
They don't want but, you know, students how to think. You know, we, we, we're talking like critical thinking is something we all understand what it means. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure we do. Oh, we don't. Oops, I didn't want that. I wanted that. Um, well, critical well, thinking, for example, critical thinking. It, well, let me, let me just say my simple yeah. definition. Critical right. thinking for me in a simplistic way is what do you think about your own thoughts? Okay, that's cer that's certainly one of the things you should be able to deal with when you're being taught critical thinking. But one of the things you want is to be able to say, if George made a following comment after we ask him that question, what do you think about your own thoughts? What you said you believe X. Why do you believe X? Then it should be possible to have a conversation, which is, well, I didn't think that argument made sense for the following reasons. I mean, that's what you want. That's what you want to be able to do. And if you can say, hey, I believe X, I should be able to come back to you and say, I don't think X makes sense for the following reasons. And it wouldn't be, I'd have to learn that an ad hominem argument is not a valid argument. I'd have to learn that an insult isn't a valued ar valuable argument. I'd have to learn that valuable counter arguments take a certain form. And then we can have a discussion, right? So you're thinking about your thoughts, but you're also, you have to express them and you also have to accept that somebody else is going to come back and say, why would you say that? I would have thought this. And then there are the rules of engagement should be clear. What's, what's a valid response? What's not a valid response? No, the response and thoughts are obviously a, a different mechanism yeah, and right. process. Okay. Um, Fred had his hands up uh, at one point. I don't know. Fred, do you still yeah, want yeah, to? Sure. Um, I'd like to say, um, I have an example like, uh, well, let's say Darwin is origin of species. Now, Darwin himself never said, this is the final word on evolution, and this is strict, right. it's not going to change. And none of his people that followed him said, that's dogma, that's it, no changes. They said, okay, well, this is a beginning point. Let us go further. That's what they did, rather than someone like, okay, uh, Alvin Hubbard saying, this is it. This is reality, and any one question, right. you're in trouble. Well, that, that's a big difference there. Yeah. Now, I would argue, because I, I, I can imagine somebody coming right up and saying, well, what about Huxley? Huxley wasn't arguing to make a dogma out of it. He was mm -hmm. arguing against the people who didn't want the ideas disseminated. But he certainly believed there was still a lot more work to be done. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. We got the idea. It makes certain predictions. Will the predictions be carried, uh, supported by the discoveries we make? It turns out that the, uh, the basic idea found plenty of evidence to support it. And more and more evidence is found every day. So, you know, that's that's also how sh how we should be thinking so it's okay to have debate it's okay to have argument it's okay to hold strongly to your position but there's still rules about how you debate and how you put forth your arguments and how you accept the legitimacy of other people arguing against well this is interesting to me too because when you're talking you you spent a lot of time talking global issues and, and global ideologies and and why an individual might subscribe to a particular right. ideology but in the time remaining and, and we have a time for a few more questions as well there's force that's involved in this force uh, there, that if you don't subscribe to our leaders ideology we're going to kill you right so that's not necessarily the, the, the ideologies that we want to subscribe to. So my question isn't that does that exist? 
or should you address that? But how do we get past that? Um, well, that's that's a multi-level uh, uh, discussion. One thing I might uh, recommend, I just uh, finished reading a book and I even put a quote from the book up on my uh, PowerPoints. Uh, it's a book called Free by a woman named Leah Upi, Y-P-I. Uh, and she was a child under the communist regime in Albania and the communist regime fell when uh, she was 11. And first of all, half of what was going on before the communist regime fell in her family, she didn't understand because her family was speaking in code and her family was sort of, you know, hiding things from her, etc. cetera. Um, clearly, once she figured out what was going on, she didn't have a lot of positive things to say about uh, the communist regime, uh, but then the World Bank and the IMF came into uh, 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 Albania and started structural reforms, which threw tens of thousands of people out of work and deprived tens of thousands of people of their uh, medical care, such as it was, and their apartments and things like that, and created a tremendous amount of misery for about 10, 12 years. And so it's like, okay, wh what exactly do I criticize? What exactly do I hold on to? What exactly uh, do I see? For a real person in the real world, the answers aren't clear. One of the reactions of people like that is that they will suddenly cling on to something that seems to give them an absolute truth. Um, but as free thinkers, we would say, no, you got to keep analyzing it. You got to keep your mind open. You got to keep looking for uh, evidence, et cetera, and uh, try and have a rational understanding of, uh, of what's going on. But emotion and psychology is, is very much wrapped up in these things. Also. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, any, other, any other comments, questions for David? Uh, before we say good night, Candace, you you want to have um, Candace? Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, my big concerns right now, both personally but certainly for the world, is the the um, the economic misery that everybody is going through, that well, most of us are going through, and it seems to me the. Um, you know, it's even codified in some, uh, at least American laws, U U.S. laws, about looking at the evidence and the results of a program and doing analysis and seeing uh, the effects of it and then deciding whether you continue a policy or a program. Um, so they've paper, actually yeah. even got that uh, as part of, you know, the f funding and the laws. And yet, in reality, um, globally, what's what's really the, where the power is, where the politics, where the power is, and what's really controlling things and happening, uh, there's no talk about ideology. Anything. It's uh, investors buying up and building all these apartments and then jacking up the rents. Uh, right uniformly for example and same with groceries and now utilities um the real power uh, the, the 0.1 percent uh you, we could you could even successfully talk about free thought and all these ideologies but the, the reality of what's happening it wouldn't affect it at all and um, I guess my thing is, what can we do to stop and change this stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, that's more than just a philosophical point, even though the philosophical point is there. One thing, one thing I will point out uh, that, that the people who are doing exactly what you do uh, or others that are contributing to this economic chaos, you know, just to put a name on it, the Koch brothers, you know, the Koch brothers uh, very much want the people in power who are going to take taxes off of the uh, super wealthy and take regulations off so they can do whatever they do. Their ideological cover 
is pretending that uh, their version of free market capitalism is morally superior, et cetera, even as people are you know, forced into these impossible situations and most people are doing their gig work instead of having a decent steady job that can provide for their family without them having to work at three or four different jobs, uh, have medical care and, and all those things. Uh, one of the ironies, and again, this is the way ideology gets mixed, misused. Uh, one of the ironies to me is that the appeal of MAGA, Make America Great Again, which is appealing to an image that didn't quite exist, but an image that existed in the minds of many people, white people, I point out, of how terrific things were in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and in the 50s and 60s, you could have a factory job five days a week, good pay, you could buy a house, you could support a family, you could have a pension. Well, the thing is that happened when there were strong labor unions, when there had been a massive government program providing money for housing and providing money for education, providing you were white, and the uh, tax rate on the wealthy was super high, much higher than it is now, uh, and you had a lot of government involvement. but. The very people who are waving the flag for MAGA don't want any of that stuff. So the ideology says, yeah, we can make America great again, but don't talk about what made it great then because we're against all of that stuff. Um, you know, so the ideology is a smokescreen. So area. talking more about the policies might actually uh, be helpful. Yes, that would be helpful, but you also have to talk about it in in a language that normal people should be able to understand. Uh, you know, I also tend to be uh, more on the left of things, and one of the uh, the problems I have with the Democratic Party is they have no conception of how to speak in a way that the average person can understand what their <laughs> policy is. And so, you know, they want to give details and they want to do this. And they want to give you, show you a chart and they want to, you know, uh, but there are things that they could do to change their. Uh, oh, history. my goodness. But uh, anyway, I don't want to get partisan because you no, could be no. perfectly good free thinker and be, you know, a, a moderate, reasonable uh, Republican. There are some of those left. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that you can be, but you know, David, uh, may, may, I just, may, may I just may I just quote you? Uh, in, if, if in you the quote me correctly, 30, <laughs> in the last 30 seconds, yes, you said normal people, yes, <laughs> and that is an ideology. That uh, okay. we have Avoid because there's no such thing as normal people. Yes, yes. There's people who agree with me and agree with you, and we think they might be normal people, but they're <laughs> fools not. that we are. Yeah, right. There's I, nothing, I like no such thing. I like to substitute um, the word common now because um, I've dealt with mental health a lot, and okay, you know, there's no normal, but what's common is kind of a more useful term, I think, um, uh, both for mental health and also yeah. um, cultural societal commentary. Right. I am right. perfectly willing to uh, take the, uh, the, corruption, the correction on the word. Food for Epicurean thought. Yes, yes. <laughs> and Epicurean <laughs> thought is all about food. So. I think one anyway. thing right in modern times is the concept of the rhino. Then, oh, well, yeah. because you're not you're a Republican at any only, so they're trying to drive out any moderates. They are trying to drive out moderates, but but they don't have a concept of what the traditional Republican Party version of conservatism was, which is very interesting. So, 
Uh, but that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole different that, discussion. Yeah. And, and David, maybe you'll come back. And, and, maybe. And chat with us. You, you, I hope you will. I hope you will. Just because, maybe. Well, I hope it's more than just maybe. Because I, I, I enjoy your, your conversations and your, 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 your discussions. I'm not sure you like the word conversations, but I, I, I no, 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 the... discussion, discussion, <laughs> right, discussion. Right. And and I want to have a conversation about the word discussion and which one is why. <laughs> <laughs> that that's at least a uh, three Manhattan discussion. <laughs> okay, well, at some point maybe we can make that a presentation. Yes, but at yes. any rate, we're, we're we're drawing to a close, and I appreciate you, David, so much more than I can express, uh, okay. but I want you to know, I count you as a friend and I count you as a, as, as a swami. And uh, I, I love the fact that you've taken your time and given it to us uh, so freely and answered all of our questions. And I appreciate everybody here who has shown up and taken their time to participate in our little chit chats. And if you're not doing anything on March 3rd, 4th, 4th 5th and 6th, Maybe we'll see you in Orlando at the Free Flow event, which you can look at at, uh, at our meetup group and uh, on their uh, website, which is freeflow.org. Um, and if you've got any questions, uh, you can email me, kenhurley88.org, uh, dot, uh, at Gmail. Um, so- um, Okay, I could, I, I could probably look this up, but you might know the answer. Are, will they have some sessions on Zoom or it's all there on the spot? I, I'm not going to try to describe what their plan is and their itineraries. I can't do that. But I, 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 am, I am planning on, on driving down and saying hello to everybody and uh, uh, representing the First Coast Free Thought Society. And um, I'll, I'll, I hope to arrive Friday night, but it's, all, it's Friday, Saturday, and, 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 and you leave Sunday. So you got two nights. You don't have to be. You don't have to spend the whole time, but I hope to be there. Uh, I, I, my, my plan is to be there Friday and Saturday and leave on Sunday. That's I'm registered for that, and I hope to see anybody and bring your friends, your family, if you want to be there, uh, because it's it's a gathering of free thought people, agnostics, atheists, and there's going to be entertainment the whole way through, and there's going to be lectures. And David, this is something I think that if they when they do this again you would be a good presenter for them um okay. they don't know about you i don't know if they do no. but i think you would be a good presenter for them and give us give them food for thought but i've never okay. been so i'm looking forward to doing it freeflow.org our meetup group madeline madeline this is where you shine <laughs> <laughs> All right, Madeline. Madeline's right. going to Madeline's going to take us out. Now, Madeline, I wish you could have some fanfare. We need some music. You know, I know. Just, <laughs> we need like a band as, playing. As you, as you push that button, we need to have a a finger, a camera on the finger, and you, we go out. All right, Madeline, it's up to you. Thank you, everybody. Everyone, have a good night. Thank okay, you so much. Thank David. you. Okay. Thank you all. Okay.